All right, I think we got it. All right, thanks for bearing with me there. So, all right, so let's get started. The promise of America is a great one. It takes hard work, sacrifice, and accountability. Um, we have not always lived up to the promise of America for some, and today we will walk a mile in someone's shoes as we discuss perception and how perception, the old phrase, perception is reality, or how do we push back against perception um, and how that can improve and strengthen our community. Um, the Voice Project is a national effort to look at how veterans and sports and sports personalities can build a bridge and relationship between police and the community. Um, please understand that we are here to listen, learn, and provide positive solutions and find common ground understanding of our differences. We don't need to agree on everything, but we need to find respect for each other on a basic human level. Uh, with that, I'll remind everybody of the town hall guidelines. Uh, the session will last until four o'clock. All audience members, uh, please mute yourself unless until called upon by the moderators. All speakers, please try to keep your remarks to one minute. This will allow for the most interaction and questions to be addressed. You can always type comments and questions into the chat box and the moderators will get to as many of those as possible. Remember, this is a nonpartisan effort, no political statements. We don't care who you voted for. Um, this is a positive, respectful dialogue on how to improve our communities by being more kind and civil to those we don't know, those we don't look like, or those we don't agree with. And if for some reason you can't follow these uh, guidelines, uh, you will be removed. So with that, uh, one of the key things we did in our last town hall was we started off with the um, scenario of is the glass half full or the glass half empty? So what I'd like everybody to do in the chat is if you could please type in your, your perspective, we won't say perception right now, but per, your perspective on the state of the city of Los Angeles in terms of community and the strength of the community, is the glass half full or half empty? If you could please type in your results right now, that would, your response, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're doing that, I would like to remind everybody that we are currently doing a Wreath Across America fundraiser. Uh, BJ's on the call today. And uh, if you donate money for the Wreath, uh, part, uh, part of that donation uh, is donated back to Life Aid. Uh, we did this last year and uh, we, we were able to yeah, hold that up, BJ. So these are the wreaths that they place at all the national cemeteries across the country. You might you might have seen today that the that the director of Arlington Cemetery decided he was going to cancel the wreaths across America, and then the secretary of the army said, uh, uh, "No, uh, that's not happening." So uh, wreaths across America, and we'll talk a little bit about it uh, at the end. So everyone's typing in their results and uh, appreciate that this was a uh, topic that we started with on our last town hall i just want to kind of get everybody's mindset in there as we see the different uh the different answers that people put in um pastor jackson how are you today I'm doing well, John. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We we, we just started off with our uh, uh, town hall. And we're we're asking people if in the state of the community is the glass half full or half empty, and people are just typing in their their answers into the chat. So as as we look at what we talked about last Tuesday, which was empathy. As we look at the glass half full and half empty, uh, I'm going to call on a couple people and, and I would like you to answer the following question. What three things would you like to hear from the police their views on 
that you that that leads you to believe the glass is half empty. So I'm going to ask Enrique to start us off. What three things would you like to speak to law enforcement about on why you believe the glass is half empty? The reason I believe it's half empty is because, I mean, it's not just law enforcement per se, it's also the community. You know, there, there has to be a common ground for change in both directions. You know, in law enforcement, you know, you're, you're patrolling an area where it's high in crime, high in drugs or high in activity, where your senses and your will to survive is going to be a little higher. So if you're dealing with constantly with people that are pulling guns at you or shooting at you, you're going to react differently to an area where kind of low crime, kind of, kind of uh, low intensity. So, I mean, the community wants change, but there has, like I said, there has to be a common ground on both ways. How can they, you know, the community change their ways and how to lower the crime, but they want to, I think they're doing it backwards, in my okay. opinion. Fair enough. Uh, we're going to get to Jose. The glass is half empty. So what three things um, would you like to, to hear or would you like to hear from the police their views on on why you think the glass is half empty? It's really one thing, really. It's, um, it's accountability. You know, when... Let's just say if I get out there and uh, there's a cop at an intersection and I run a light or run a stop, you know, I made a decision to do, you know, to follow through with an action that just wasn't right, right? So I get pulled over, I get a ticket, you know, I'm expected to pay it, you know, the follow through. Um, and, you know, there's that's kind of like on, on, the, on the topic of, uh, you know, the whole shooting thing. It's like... Uh, Yes, there was a situation there. They were forced to stop a person, whether if it was forced or not. But, um, you know, they made a decision to handle the situation a certain way that, you know, may have panned out to where a life was lost or there was severe brutality. You know, uh, it's easy to say that, oh, I, for my life, or um, I was thinking of my partner. Um, those are easy lines to, to throw out to justify an action, kind of like as if I have an intruder um, and I, you know, into my home and, and I, I take action and I fire upon the person, take their life, and I say, felt for my family, so therefore I may get away. Um, but there's still some consequences depending on the situations aren't being enforced to where people are getting away, getting away with uh, just making bad decisions, you know. Um, I know you said three, but that's, that's just that's the one thing that comes to my mind. Okay, excellent. So now I'm going to switch over to some of the folks that said the glass was half full. So as I look at, we'll go to Mayor Yasmin because we always got to start with the mayor. Um, so Yasmin, what are what are things you would like to say to the community? What three things would you like to say to the community that that leads you to believe the glass is half full? Personally, I feel like it is half full because there are some, there's a lot of um, remedies here, especially for like minorities. And also the fact that I'm kind of like in a diverse community and I'm able to be around people I know and feel comfortable. And also another thing I would say is that they're compared to like other cities where I know tensions can be very high. I feel it isn't as high and I feel a bit more safer here as well. Okay. Um, we're going to call on a couple more of these ROTC cadets. Um, Fari Hernandez, are you there? Fari, if you can unmute yourself. You, you have to hit... Uh, 
Um, is it star seven on the phone or what, what is it you have to hit? There you are. All right. So Fari, tell us what you, what three things lead you to believe that the glass is half full? Oh, I guess that we re that I don't really relatively hear about any major crime going on, and that my area, which is a bit rather metropolitan, is somewhat safe, and I feel safe, so I think that's what makes it half full. And what area is that, just so everybody knows? Oh, East Hollywood. Okay. All right. Um, as is BD Rodriguez? I probably butchered your name. Sorry. You can call ER. her ER. ER, are you are you there? You are uh, ER. Tell us yeah, why I, you think the glass <laughs> is half full. Uh, I could say it's half full because I haven't seen too much crime, as Fari said, and. As much as we don't see as much crime, but we still see a little bit of more homeless people around. But in my situation, I feel safe. Okay. So for for those of you that think the glass is half full and, and you think you feel safe, what is your perception of law enforcement? We'll start with ER since you were just on. Can you repeat the I question said, again? Can you tell the group what is your perception of law enforcement? Corrupt. Corrupt. Okay. What else? What else comes to mind when you think of law enforcement in your community? Too much power in some okay. people. Anything else? And sometimes, um, is that it? And sometimes could be good. And okay. that's it. Fari Hernandez, talk to us about your perception of law enforcement. I think that they are doing a pretty good job. Okay. Any, anything else? Anything else come to mind when you think of the law enforcement in your community? Nothing much. I don't really interact with them. Okay. Mary, Mary Yasmin? Yes. Um, I would have to um, agree with Fari. I feel like it is doing a, well, a good job, at least in like my community specifically because i do see law enforcement um sometimes but not too often and the crime around my community isn't so high um so i feel it's okay. doing well. all right so now i want to throw it over to to the law enforcement folks on on the call and, and you guys get your chance to to talk to the community i want to start with you paul because i know that you wanted to talk a little bit about the stuff from last week and uh, also as you hear the, the different things that people are saying, there's a, um, there's a, you, you can see like a disconnect between people saying the glass is half full, but yet their perception of the police is negative. So talk a little bit about your perception and what you've heard so far, even though we're, we're just getting started. Um, you know, John, I'll always go back to the very first town hall I sat in. And you know, if you remember, you did that exercise where you went around to various people and you said, you know, how do you view yeah. the police as the wolf, the sheepdog or the sheep? And, you know, some of the answers just really, you know, left me, you know, kind of speechless in the moment um, and really made me think like, OK, hey, what are we doing as police officers that are giving you know, people that perception? Right. When we get called to a, 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 you know, a call, um, 
you know, what, how are we acting, you know, that's, that's making people view that? Or is it all more driven by the media? Now, we can't control the media, but we can control our actions. Um, so I thought long and hard about that. But somewhere along the line, I think I suggested to you, like, hey, you know, you can turn that around. You know, I think it would help give some people, you know, um, uh, perception, you know, going the other way is ask some officers how they view the public as the wolf, the sheepdog, or the sheep. Um, Because when we show up to, you know, uh, a call or if we observe something that makes us say, hey, you know what, I should go check that out. I should go see what's going on over there. Um, You know, we have to do an investigation and, you know, we don't know who the bad person is, right? Who's the suspect? We don't know who the victim is until we start showing up and asking questions, right? Because drug dealers don't run around with drug dealer across their shirt. You know, the victims, you know, don't have victim, you you know, um, uh, on their shirt. So um, we, we don't know. And how people act, how people respond to when we show up, well, hey, that drives then our opinion. And to go, to go back to last week, um, one of the people who is uh, in the room with you, you know, happened to you know, say something about you know, feeling like they get bullied by the police. Um, you know, and, no, and um, again, I'll always... That was Dex. What's that? Yeah, keep going. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll always sit there and say, okay, let, let me check my actions first. Is there something that I'm doing? I mean, that's given that perception. But after 16 years of police work, um, you know, I, I feel like it's a combination of, yeah, sometimes officers show up and, and they react. Um, they maybe overreact to certain things. Um, but you also have to understand how we're or, you know, um, our actions are driven by, number one, our past experience, right? We show up to, you know, these calls, um, you know, any, anything can and has happened. Um, and also, you know, pe- again, people's actions drive us to have a certain opinion and act accordingly. Um, and as human beings, right, police officers were human beings, we're subject to conditioning just like everybody else. So after going on dozens, hundreds of calls, right, and constantly being, you know, lied to, or, or possibly even worse, right, people wanting to fight you, wanting to run away from you, you know, you become conditioned, and at times you get short, right? And I think sometimes that gets perceived as, you know, um, you know, bullying would maybe just be just one word, um, you know, that can be described, it can describe police a- actions from the other side. And again, I will always say, hey, what can the police do better, right? You know, I mean, we need to have thicker skin, right, when we show up to, to these things. Um, but again, very often we're dealing with people, right, that are not the type of people that are on this call, right? They're of a, of a different element. Um, you know, they're not interested in improving the world like I think everybody on this call is. Um, so I think it's just important, um, you know, to, again, uh, you know, this whole thing is, you know, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, right? You know, learn somebody else's perception um, about, hey, what we go through, you know, when we show up to stuff. Can we do better? Yes. I will always, I will always be my, the first thing that, hey, police can always do better. But I think if there is, you know, maybe sometimes a little bit better under understanding of what we go through, right, how we've been conditioned from the years, you know, prior on the job, right, that's what drives, you know, our actions very often. Um, and I just think that that's important. And I like said, started getting talked about last week, um, there was some back and forth, but thing between Dex and the sheriff and like the conversation kind of started to go in that direction. Um, but then it, you know, it kind of veered into in a different direction. And I, you know, I've been on a few of these with these. And I just feel like sometimes that's just not necessarily getting, you know, spoken. I'll, maybe somebody's afraid to say it that, hey, you know, when we show up to something, right, very often our actions are dictated by your actions. Even something as simple as, you know, uh, you stop somebody for speeding. You know, listen, I think most cops, we don't want to write tickets. We want to, you know, just give people a warning and have that be the thing that makes them stop speeding, right? Because it's all about changing behavior, right? But when a person wants to deny that they were speeding, make excuses, et cetera, et cetera, very often then we say, well, hey, you know what? Looks like the warning isn't going to cut it here. I guess I got to give it a ticket. So again, very often our actions are driven by, right, what we perceive, right, once we show up to something. I just think that's important to know. No, no, it's, it's important. Good. To know. It's good. Um, so, um, uh, Officer Joe. So I'm, I'm going to give you a chance. I saw you doing a lot of nodding there while Paul was speaking. So talk to us about your perception 
And, and what your takeaway is, you know, we had three high school students talk about the community. I, I saw you taking lots of notes. So um, what's your perception of, of what you would like to say back to them? Um, well, <clears throat> social media is very uh, difficult to, uh, I guess, work with. Um, social media, um, of course, changes the narrative in so many ways where, um, let's say, someone has a verified account and whether or not if it's uh, viable information or the wrong information, just the fact that it's a verified account, uh, the fact that people will believe it more often than not. Um, you know, for me, like hearing like the negativity with with uh, how police are looked at, I mean, it it does affect us. I mean, you know, our profession and why we signed up uh, for this job, it's, uh, you know, it kind of hurts. It, it really does. Um, I'm an immigrant from the Philippines, grew up, um, you know, in a hut north of Philippines, um, where luckily my mom went off ahead of us back in 1980, leaving us for a year and a half. First job was at Dairy Queen. I don't know how how she she saved the money, but um, she got three uh, three of her sons away from uh, our uh, biological dad, who was alcoholic, and grew up in Rampart. Went fishing in Macarthur Park Lake. I don't know what was in there, but it was fun <laughs> fishing in that lake. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't grow up um, drawing police cars or fire trucks or me dreaming become a becoming a police officer. Um, you know, I became a police officer at age 30. I'm I'm uh, 45 right now. Uh, been a police officer for about 15 years. And uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's really cool to, to uh, patrol the streets that I walk to, uh, to, to uh, school and from school. And, um, um, but, you know, um, I'm glad I'm in my position working for the chief's office and and uh, being in community relations, especially um, my role as the uh, youth liaison. Um, you know, um, I'm finding out, I'm trying to find so many ways to connect with not just the youth, but the young adults, you know, and um, um, just trying to listen and hear because, you know, we've, we've, we've been, um, you know, not good listeners in the past. So we have to learn from our mistakes and not push all the all the negativity or the the, the mistakes that we've uh, made uh, in the past. I mean, we have to learn from them. And and um, and I'm sure I'm not sure if um, you know about our critical incident videos where it shows the good tactics and the bad tactics. But um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of evil people in the world and those radio calls that we respond to. And I've called 911 myself when I was a kid. And when you call 911, it's usually someone's worst day of their life. So you have two officers that have no idea what's happening at this location. All they have is this um, frantic phone call of minimal information of a domestic violence or, a, or some sort of major incident. And they just have to go from that. You know, uh, suspect descriptors of, uh, you know, male, Hispanic, white, or whatever, white t-shirt, blue jeans. I mean, um, it's, we try to teach the public from head to toe, you know, um, um, green hat, uh, button shirt with plaid, just just be descriptive because it kind of narrows, uh, narrows down who we should stop. So, you know, teaching the public that is critical because we don't want to stop anybody that doesn't need to be stopped. Um, it's just we don't have that information when we get to an incident. Um, but, uh, you know, um, but when people learn or interact or see police experiences only through social media and never a face to face interaction, and, you know, there's not uh, a lot of officers that are, you know, um, the most approachable, you know, I mean, I would suggest or recommend that you say hello to police officer and, you know, uh, break that ice. I mean, for me, you know, I, I could kind of run my mouth for like hours and just, 
you know, talk about mountain biking like <laughs> earlier. And, and my daughter bombing down a hill on her mountain bike as a five-year-old. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to go home and kiss my daughter goodnight. No, that's us. good. Um, we have uh, Jaretta Sandoz from the LAPPL just joined our town hall too. So we'll, we'll let her listen in for a little bit before we throw it to her. But um, so we're, we're we, you know, one of the old expressions is perception is reality. Right. That's something we hear a lot about um, on last Tuesday. Dave Roberts uh, at, at the end of the town hall was talking about perception. And he also was talking about things like uh, systematic racism or systematic deficiencies in the police department and, and all these different things. And so that was his perception. And I want to I want to push back or push on that topic, because uh, one of the things that he said that I really liked was, that, that he would like to see the police departments and law enforcement be less defensive and, and be more proactive in explaining, kind of like what we were talking about earlier or, or, or so far on this call, pushing back against false perceptions. And so one of the ways you can do that is with data and data analytics. And that's one of the things that, you know, we at LifeAid and, and our brain research and things that we're doing here, we, we like to look at analytics. And how, you know, what are the actual numbers? When people say, you know, a perception, what does the data say? Um, and obviously data analytics is big now in sports. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about from a sports perspective. We got Mike Haynes on the call. And uh, Mike Haynes was a, a member of the Los Angeles Raiders when they won the Super Bowl in, I think, 1984. He was uh, in the Hall of Fame and voted one of the top 100 um, players of all time for the NFL 100th anniversary. Um, some would say he's the best cornerback, although Lester Hayes may complain about that, that ever played the game. So Mike, um, as you look at analytics, how, how can analytics perhaps help us change perception? Um, you know, I, I think it would start with what our people's perceptions and how did they establish them? Um, you know, I think, you know, I grew up in that Rampart area, um, Joe, all right, and that wasn't, that wasn't a great place to uh, have a relationship with the cops around there. Um, as a kid, we all just wanted to be athletes. We wanted to play baseball, football, basketball, and things like that. And so, Unfortunately, sometimes we break the law to do those things. Like we hop the fence at the elementary school to go inside and play basketball outside. You know, it should, and there's so many times that we did it and then you see a, a police car drive up and the kids would just run, you know? Um, uh, and that would, you know, now knowing what I know, I would have fought for someone to be there, you know, to have the, um, that maybe lived across the street from the school that had a relationship with the school that will allow us to go talk to them and say, hey, when you open up the gate for us so we can play? Uh, and I think that would have been fine. But we grew up thinking, oh, shoot, here come the cops. We got to go. We broke the law by hopping the fence, you know? Um, so, we, you know, I can't say we had a great relationship with them. And that really made it difficult. Um, but now knowing that those experiences kind of shaped my life, you know, when it comes to police officers, we play football in the middle of the street. Uh, and, and listening to some of what the guys are saying is like, you don't know who the good guys are, who the bad guys are out there playing football with us. And we don't know what happened in our neighborhood that maybe someone did something in our neighborhood and the police officers are, police officers are driving around looking for someone with jeans and a white shirt. We have no idea. But when they drive by really slow and they're eyeballing us and everything, we're like, well, what the heck? What's going on? This is crazy. Man, just we're, you interrupted our game, you know, and so we're not we're not aware. We're not thinking that maybe there's a reason for them driving slow. We're thinking they don't really care about us. They just want to interfere with our game and all those kinds of things. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is I think we just need to have more meetings like this. You know, people just need to get together and um, uh, and, you know, like uh, I heard one of the officers say that, um, you know, just be as descriptive as you can so you know what you're looking for. If, you, if they don't have that information, 
Then we all suffer. Then they're going to ask, who's, you know, what are you kids doing here? You know, uh, and really they're looking for one guy. And that guy may not be in our group and he might be in our group. And we may not know what that guy did, you know, and, you know, he just came in and said, hey, can I play? I go, yeah, sure. We don't know that he might have done something before he got there. So I just think that um, just understanding the problem uh, and that officers have makes it a little different uh, for me as a, you know, even as now I'm in my 60s and I think back, I worry about my own son because he's tall and his body language is not good. If he just stands there, people are going to say, you know, that kid's got a problem, you know, and the way he's going to talk to the police officer is going to be challenging, you know, like, you know, he's going to ask him a question and goes, why do I have to answer that? You know, he's going to be a smart mouth kid, you know, but even though we try to uh, educate our kids to, you know, that their body language matters and the things they say matters, if we're if their parents are not around, the kids are may not always um, doing the, the, the right thing or the best thing um, to or for them or for any of the other kids that are there. So I just think that we just need to share more information. Um, the police officers probably need to be more active in the community and the, at the schools and everything and talking to the kids. And I don't know if, um, I don't know if it makes a difference if they have the uniforms on or off, you know, when they're having those kind of communications. But um, uh, in, in some ways, I feel like the, the uniform, I wish it changed because there's just so many negative stories and situations when the guys are wearing those black uniforms and the big old um, badge on their left, you know, left chest pad. Um, and for a lot of us, that's, that's negative. As soon as I see it, I'm not thinking that, oh, here comes the guy that can help us. I'm not feeling that way. I'm thinking, oh, crap. Here comes a guy that uh, if I say anything, he might throw me against the wall or, you know, or, or do something like that. Um, and I've had, growing up in that area, I had a lot of encounters with police officers. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I really think that they were warranted because we were smart mouth kids and stuff like that uh, for no reason. But, but as I got older, I realized that their behavior and their being tough with us we don't know what happened in their day. We don't even know what's going on in our community around the, around the block. You know, we don't know if, if, if um, some woman um, had, you know, something happened to her or, or whatever. We have no idea. And they're not going to tell us, you know, and they're just doing their job. And I just think that if we had more communication about what their job is, how we can help with their job, uh, like if they come over and, and they, they tell us that something's happened and they ask us, uh, did you see a guy with white shirt and jeans uh, run through here? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, and I've, I've lived a, a long time now, and I know that there have been some people that, that would say they would never tell the police officer, yeah, there was a guy had on jeans and a white shirt that ran through here. And, and I would say if they were having these open uh, conversations, that I think that they probably would tell, say, yeah, there was a guy who ran through here with jeans and a white shirt. Um, and, you know, because they have a, they, they want their neighborhood to be safe and um, they don't want the police officers coming in there, not trusting any of the kids. And so even, even if there's a hundred kids in there and there's 10 bad kids, they all, all hundred will get treated bad because of those 10, you know, and, um, and there's not much you can really do because the kids don't know what is causing that, those problems. But if you had meetings, I think you could, and it could might, you know, could have a different outcome. So I'm glad to hear everybody just kind of open up and talk about these things. And, um, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot of good so, that comes out. Mike, you mentioned uh, a couple times in that, um, that you're old. Um, <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> older, older. I'm older. So you're, yeah. you're a man of experience. So, as a man of experience, yeah. I want to touch on this idea of systematic and how people, I think it's a perception. And so as someone who grew up in the 60s, where there really was systematic um, discrimination or racism, talk about, I'm going to ask you first, and then I'm going to go to uh, Jonathan from UCLA. I'm going to go to him second because he's a young guy, a younger guy. Um, 
and Younger, and try yeah. to get some perspective on the perception of when people talk about systematic racism or systematic problems within law enforcement. Well, I had a, a, a situation where I was at a conference and it was, you know, uh, it was a time in my life where uh, I was with a bunch of Christian kids and, uh, and we were talking to, this is when I was in the NFL in the off season, and we were talking to kids at a detention center. And, um, and, and so it was Christian police officers and Christian football players. We were all in there and I was just there to kind of learn. I was a babe in Christ as he called me at that time. And, uh, but when we left and we were going back to our hotel, uh, I rode with a, a couple of officers and, and as we were driving down the street, there were some guys on a corner, three kids, you know, Latino kids. And, he, and uh, he said, you know, sometimes, you know, these kids, they just do this and they do that. And, you know, like, look at those kids over there. And I looked over there, I just see three kids. He saw something else. He saw three troublemakers. And he says, look at the way they're dressed. I'm going, what? I said, man, that's the way they dress in this neighborhood. What are you talking about? You know? So um, that threw me for a loop. And I'm like thinking, wow, all those kids had to do was come out of their house and they're going to look like trouble. And that's just not fair. Uh, you know, if, um, if, and if that is going to be the way it is, I think that the police officers or the people in the school or people at the church or, or whatever, should tell the kids what's going on and you know like whatever you do don't pull your pants down below your you know your butt or whatever you know <laughs> um, you know stuff like that you know just just let them know just let them know just be open and honest like when you're when you're dressing when you're dressing like that that is the that is the dress that is commonly um thought of as you know uh, you know a certain type of kid and so if you don't care what that is, then you don't care. But if you do care, then you pull your pants up. Or if it's like, you know, my, if, you're, if you knew that, if you knew why the guys were doing it and you wanted to agree with it, go ahead. But I don't think there was ever any discussion about it. And I, I never even thought about that until we're just driving down the street. And he said, yeah, you see those kids right there? Those, those, are, those are bad kids. And the he, only thing he could say, he didn't talk to any of them. We were driving in a car. So he was basing it on the clothes that they were wearing, you know, and maybe just standing on the corner, you know, just, you know, doing idle stuff around the corner. Um, but anyway, I, that that's um, I just think that all these kinds of problems um, just need to be discussed. And I I did mention it to them in the car, like saying, you know, I can't believe that you think that those are bad kids just because of the way they're dressed and they happen to be on the corner. Uh, that's what a lot of kids do. It's like a meeting place. So it's going to go so it's a perception. hang out and uh, it's all perception. It's all perception. And I think that by talking about these perceptions, you can do a lot of good on both sides or all sides, I should say, because I think there are way more. Okay. Than so um, you, you mentioned a couple different things, but I want to throw it to Jonathan. He's a new guy. So first, Jonathan, as, as the new guy, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, what's your background. And then talk to us about, as a young guy, we hear young guys on the news every day talking about systematic problems with the police department and, and what's your perception of that? Yes, sir. So my name is uh, First Lieutenant Garrido and I'm from Jersey City, New Jersey, born and raised. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah. yeah. So she's very familiar with uh, in our area, very Hispanic uh heavily area, and I'm a first lieutenant now in the Army. I'm teaching over at uh, UCLA now, and I'm helping with their recruitment. Uh, so that's more or less my background, and I went to Rutgers University in uh, New Brunswick, yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, so that's, that's Paul, Paul and, uh, and Renata are New Jersey people. Yeah. The great, the great state. The next clown over from Jersey City. All right. I'm a Seton Hall guy, I'm a Seton Hall guy myself. Yeah, okay. My dad yeah. taught Seton Hall and he went to Rutgers. It's great, great to see some New Jersey folks here. It's, you yeah. know, we're, we're a hated state. We're a hated, it's tough. It is. It All is. All right. So, so moving forward, uh, in terms of the systematic, so a, a lot of things have been discussed. Um, and a couple of things I want to touch on, and I, and I think the biggest thing really is perception because growing up, 
me personally, I never had a lot of trouble or encounters with the police. I was always playing soccer or somewhere all the time. I was just always with my friends playing sports, playing sports, and that's that's really all I did. And I never really encountered any issues. Uh, but on the other hand, my brother had so many issues. And I think uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Haynes mentioned is that body language. My brother just has that aggressiveness about him, just looking at him, you know, and, and he's not going to take things well, and he has a smart mouth, uh, and he's always had a bad experience. Um, and, it, and it's the way that he approaches the situation. Uh, because, you know, everybody tells me and my brother were the same person when they meet us, yet I've never had an issue with an encounter with a police officer, and he always does. Uh, and again, it is that body language and that, that discussion does need to be had at a young age. It's like, hey, when you present yourself to them, just know that they're doing a job um, and, and don't be so defensive uh, because once, you know, when you approach him, he's already angry, he's already defensive. It's just not going to go well. Meanwhile, I'm always just respectful. I say, hey, you know, what's the problem or, you know, what, what can I do? And, and I've never had a, a problem ever. Uh, so really, it, it really is a about that body language that you were mentioning, Mr. Haynes. So that, that, that is huge. And, and, and again, for the, R, for the ROTC high school guys on here too, uh, I heard some of their points and I think it's very important. Again, another thing about perception is as you grow older and you start to meet, you know, all your high school friends that go off to be teachers, doctors, lawyers, uh, police officers, you're really gonna get a different understanding uh, of police officers. Like the officer said earlier, he just wants to go home and kiss his daughter at night. And sometimes it's so hard to look at them as people. Uh, you know, they are, they're just people and they're just doing a job. Just like when you're in elementary school and you forget that your teacher's a person and you think they just like go in some closet and turn off the light. And that's what your teacher does all the time. Uh, and then you get older and you have friends that are teachers and you're like, wow, these people, I mean, that's just one part of their day. Uh, it's so different from what they, what they do at work. So that's the biggest thing I'll say, especially for the high school kids growing up, I have a ton of, friends that are police officers now in New Jersey. And I don't think, I think especially with this generation coming in, that systematic racism is gonna be uh, a big issue. I think it is more of the fear of approaching dangerous situations uh, and having to react in those dangerous situations uh, because all the friends that I know that have became police officers, you know, I ask them what they think, you know, to get a really good insight look on what's going on and uh, a lot of the issues that we've been having in the country. And don't get me wrong, there's always gonna be bad apples. You see that in the military as well, uh, all the time. There's some soldiers that I, I just can't believe some of the things they do, uh, but that doesn't represent the army and that doesn't represent what the army is. Uh, I, I would say 99% of the soldiers that man the army are amazing. Uh, and, and when they're called heroes, I agree with that, but there's, there's some bad apples. There's some guys out there that, that are just crazy. I can't even believe some of the soldiers uh, that I've seen in my formation do things that they've done. It, it's, it's astonishing. And every time that I ask my friends that are police officers, like, hey, what did you think about this? They're astonished and they're hurt as well. Um, and I think once you actually get to know people on a personal level that you grew up with even, that are taking these jobs now, and you know them from the time they were kids, because you have that trust that they're not lying to you, tell you like, that hurt me, you know, that made me feel so bad because these people are saying these nasty things about us. Uh, and I'm just trying to do a job and you know their families, you know their kids, and, and you know that those aren't bad people uh, and that they are just trying to do a job. So I think really it, it's all about perception. I think the further we go, especially with media, technology and exposure, um, the systematic racism isn't going to be too much of a problem going forward. I think it's just understanding their job. Uh, and like Mr. Haynes said, even my own brother, just a, an issue with that body language, um, how, how he approaches these things. Uh, and th that really is the biggest issue. And then the biggest fix, I, I would say, is definitely exposure to the community because, for example, I'm an immigrant myself. Well, my parents are immigrants as well. I'm a first generation American. I didn't even speak English until I failed first grade because uh, my parents couldn't teach me because they didn't know. Uh, and I had to redo the grade. And when I told my mother I wanted to join the military, she, she was so against it. She said, those people don't care about you. And, you know, they don't care about us. We're just immigrants here and you're just a number. Uh, and all, she was so worried, but she had no idea what the military was. Uh, and now I joined the military and she met all my friends and she's giving out hugs and kisses and asking how their families are doing and, and praying for them on their deployments. And now she appreciates the military so much. Uh, she really has a sense of pride in our military, but how can she have ever had that without exposure? She never even met somebody in uniform uh, before I joined. I never met anybody in uniform until I went to college. Uh, so it's 
you just if you don't have that exposure, you'll never understand, and the media isn't going to paint a pretty picture for you uh, in jobs like ours. So my mom said the military is terrible; they don't care about their soldiers. You know, they're going to send you off to die, and, and you know she thinks it's a movie that you're always in this combat zone, and and it's nothing like that. Um, and she had the same perception about police officers growing up. So my brother always used to get in trouble. And of course, you know, it's never, it's my son's fault. Uh, she's very defensive. And uh, now she knows a lot of our friends that are police officers. And, you know, hugs and kisses all around and, and praying for them on, on their patrols. So I think once we have that community outreach and we're constantly exposed to them in a good sense. And I think like Mr. Haynes said, uh, I think it is important for them to be in uniform. Uh, and I just say that because it really paints a positive image in your head, whereas opposed, if you see them in civilian clothing, uh, it really won't hit home. As opposed to, you know, if you come to a pickup basketball game and there's a police officer playing outside, uh, and you see them all the time in these positive interactions, you're, you're just going to be so much more open to them right, when they right. do show up. Uh, so, uh, sorry that's for the okay. that's good. long comment. So, a couple, couple things were, were mentioned, and so I want to bring in the faith community, because I think that's a very important constituency into this equation and how it's been mentioned a few times on the call. We have with us Pastor Charles Jackson. Are you with us, sir? So I talk am, to man. us about the role that the, the faith community can play to reinforcing uh, positive perceptions and, and build bridges between the community and, and law enforcement. Let me first say hello to everyone, and thank you once again, John, for welcoming I think the, the faith community is the key to uh, bringing everyone together. And, you know, you were down here, I think, a couple of months ago with us, and we reached out even before the end. We at uh, Macedonia Baptist Church in Daphne had set up a, where well, we had the FBI, the local police, the sheriff's office, and we came, and they came, and the kids, switched roles so the kids became the police officers and the police officers became the civilians and it showed them what officers go through and how at a spur of a moment they have to make a decision on whether to pull their weapons or, you know their lives are always on, on the line whether it's something simple and so we you know from from my standpoint we appreciate all that you all do uh, officers and first responders and the military and everyone. And so we've tried to have that ongoing relationship with them where we actually feed the officers once a year, as well as the fire department. And we want them to know who we are and we want to know who they are. And it's a small town in, in Alabama and Daphne, Baldwin County. But I think they have really set the example as far as uh, small police force is not a whole lot. It's the fastest growing county in the state of Alabama, but the faith-based community churches have to be that gap between the community and the police officers and let, and establishing a relationship where you shouldn't be afraid of them. I, I want them, I, I know the police chief firsthand, and now as they got some new officers, I want all those officers to know me, know me and my family as well and all of the Macedonian family. So I think it's just a matter of respect going both ways. Uh, we're going to have to build upon the perception in some departments that's that's there as far as them being bad guys. And I know they're, they're bad police officers and there's a whole lot of good ones. And because of that small, uh, minute bad apples, it puts the perception on everyone as far as being bad. And it's something that shouldn't be done and it has spilled over. Uh, from the community, because you look at the community, it's the same, it's pretty much the same way. We're witnessing that firsthand. So the, the faith-based uh, Christian community has to be the go-between as far as bridging the gap. We've even brought in, John, I think we told you, we even brought in a uh, one of the police officers who was a detective. We brought him in a couple of times and had to, wanted them to tell us if we had an active shooter in the church, what we're supposed to do. And yeah. I'm turning the video on now. Uh, so what we're supposed to do as far as, you know, if we have to pull our weapons out and defend ourselves. And he told us, you know, to, to run, hide and fight. 
And then he did say that if the other thing that he said, if you do pull your weapon and you have to kill or shoot the person that's there, he said, make sure by the time the police department gets there, a police officer get there, you don't have that weapon in your hand. Because when they arrive, they're not going to know who the shooter is. So he said, get, get, go put it some, put it away. Because even though you may have been defending yourself, when they arrive, adrenaline is flowing and they're not going to know who, who it is that they're supposed to, uh, who the active shooter is or who the person is. So we learn a whole lot by, by trying to bridge that gap in the community. And hopefully when everything's settled, we'll be able to have an, another one. At the time, we had the state attorney general uh, was down as well. And it, it went very well. I think we need to do another one. And it was, you know, our church that reached out to them and say, we need to do something so we can, you know, so the killing won't go on here in Baldwin County. And I must come in. I think, John, you probably saw, I think it's been about yeah. two months now, the shooting at, uh, at Dick was, it, it wasn't Dick's. It was one of the sporting uh, goods was store it, was, over there. Yeah, in, I think it was Dick's County. in Spanish Hills. Oh, in Spanish, yeah, over in Spanish Fort, and and this particular, and I commended the officers. They did, if 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 they had it has have it recorded, it needs to be shown throughout the department because this particular guy, African American, uh, had multiple assault rifles, had shot up the sporting goods store. I think he let go about 25, 30 50. rounds, and I said. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, was like it was up rounds. there. <laughs> it was fifty rounds, and and I said he's got to be dead. I automatically assumed that they had killed him, but they end up. Uh, yep. I think they end up tasing him. End up end up tasing. So you're talking about a textbook uh, takedown, and they they were uh, awarded. I think it was three officers who were awarded uh, a couple of months ago for being able to take that down because that person was supposed to be dead with that, that many weapons and then uh, unloading them. So I, I just feel that that's where we stand and not only within the police department, but the church has to be the forefront of even what we're dealing with now in the society. And, you know, we, we have to be able to, to be at the forefront to say, hey, we can all come together. And and so that's that's my stance on it. And that's that's what I I believe. I try to stay biblical based as far as things and nothing that we're going through hadn't you you won't you can find anything already in the Bible as far as how to deal with certain situations. Thanks thanks a lot. Uh, no, I, I, I you know how much I enjoy every time every chance I get for us to chat. Um, we did have a remarkable live yeah. in person town hall in uh, Daphne, Alabama around, uh, I think it was September 10th, actually, and that the shooting that he described took place the Sunday before we did our town hall. And um, it was uh, it was quite remarkable how, how all that played out and the, the results of our town hall and how it brought the community together with a bunch of high school students, um, you know, is, is, is really good. And if you haven't already seen it uh all of our town halls are on our life aid research institute uh, youtube channel and you can check them all out i i posted in the chat the the town hall we did last week at the yal for for anybody who missed out and wanted to uh um to hear that so i want to bring in uh jaretta sandos um she's on the board of the la police protective league which is the union that represents the rank and file lapd officers and she was part of our town hall last week and has been on a number of these um, town hall virtual sessions. So welcome, Jaretta. And, and my question to you is the, the L.A. Police Union has been one of the most proactive. And this goes back to, again, Dave Roberts had a comment about how the, the police department needs to be um, less defensive and go, go on the offensive and, and change perception. The LA Police Protective League has been really good at that. At one of the main, if one of the few, I should say, um, unions to do that. And a lot of people perceive the unions as resistant to change. So talk to us about the efforts at the LA PPL and, and let the community people on this call and, and around the country know about what you guys are doing.
Hopefully she's there. She might be on the phone. So um, we'll, we'll come back to her. Um, we also have with us um, Susan Hudson. Are you there, Susan? I know I saw you, uh, your camera was on a few minutes ago. Are you still there? Uh, maybe she, are you there, Susan? Uh, there you are. Oh, oh, John, I'm sorry. I'm here. I, I didn't know how to take up myself. Oh, that's okay. Sorry we'll, about we'll, that. We'll have you go first and then Susan will come up after you. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan, no, she to cut you off. You no, want me to yet. wait until Susan? Oh, okay. No okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Joretta Sandoz. I'm the vice president of the Los Angeles Police Protective League. And I enjoy being on these town halls. They're very informative. And we can get a lot of, because you know what? Perception is reality. So I know um, when we were on our, our panel with Dave Roberts, he had a perception, and that is his reality. So I think that what we need to do as police officers, and also um, there's a perception about the union, but first as police officers, um, we have to be able to listen and to um, open up lines of communication. Um, I was really impressed with Jonathan um, because he has um, friends that are actually police officers and he's able to see a different uh, side of, he's able to see the human side, we're human. And I think sometimes people think we're robots, but as far as a union, um, we are at the forefront of, of reform. And I know that there's a perception of the union that we protect bad officers, but that's absolutely false because a good officer doesn't want to tarnish or doesn't want anyone on the department to tarnish the badge. And we don't wanna be around the bad apples. And there are bad apples, there are bad actors. And we have to make sure that we identify the bad actors and uh, point in case, March 25th, everything changed. March 25th was when George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. And we've been feeling the wrath, law enforcement throughout the country has been feeling the wrath of that ever since March 25th. And it, and it, it just recently started uh, letting up, but we had to um, be on the front lines getting rocks and bottles and uh, bricks and lasers uh, uh, attack and, and officers were attacked because of something that occurred but it brought back a lot of the feelings that some people in the community had from years and years and years ago and we can't we as law enforcement can't ignore that we can't ignore the voice of the community but this is something and when John talks about analytics um, we're really um, heavy on analytics and um, you know what what the reality is is that 70% of all violent crime victims are either black or Hispanic. That's 70% in Los Angeles. And then also there's about 83% of all violent crime suspects that are black or Hispanic. And, and you know what? No one wants to hear that, but it's the truth. Um, the police officers don't make, sit here and make up uh, stats. These are reported crimes. So now we have to worry about and, and I like um, what Mr. Jackson was talking about in the faith community. You know, we definitely need the faith community. I've, I've been going to church in Watts for, for 20 years. Um, and, and, um, um, and, my, and, and our church is called Macedonia as well. But um, we have to get these youth out of trouble. I mean, we have to save their lives because you know what? There's 99.9% .9 of the community are good, law-abiding people that want to be safe they want to be able to walk to the park with their kids but you have that percentage of of suspects and of people who want to terrorize them and and that's what the police are for they're they're there to protect the the law-abiding citizens uh, in a community so um you know police work isn't pretty and and sometimes um there's things that uh, sometimes that there's there's um uh, arrests that, that need to be made and sometimes suspects don't want to be arrested but um, we still need to make sure that we um, respect uh, people in the community and like uh, Mr. Hayes was saying and, and go Raiders but like Mr. Hayes was saying um, you know that the three young gentlemen that were on the corner uh, when he was riding in, in, the, in the police car um, 
you know, I don't know what those police officers saw, but if it's three young people just standing on the corner and they're um, profiling them, then we, we have a problem. Um, so there's things that police officers have to do to build trust back in the community. And I think all of us together on this call with the faith community, with prominent people, with community members, with fellow officers that want to um, have this dialogue, I think that we're headed in the right direction. And like I told John, I will be here um, to help out. Um, I appreciate everyone on the call and everyone's uh, uh, voice that they lend on the call. And then maybe we can have more of these conversations and, and build that relationship back up in the Thanks. community. And you, you bring up a couple good points and a couple things that you said that I think will throw right to Susan. So one of the things that you said is that there's a perception that police unions protect bad officers. And I saw a lot of people nodding their heads and, and, uh, and then of course the, you know, different unions have, you know, that perception. So Susan, as, as, uh, if you could tell everybody, I don't sure that everybody knows who you are, but if you could uh, uh, let everybody know who you are and, and I'll throw that first question to you, uh, what's your perception on police unions protecting bad officers? Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, as John said, I'm Susan Hudson. I'm the police monitor in the city of New Orleans, and I'm also the president of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, or NACL. It's, I'll put it in the chat box if you want to learn more about what we do. Um, so we, and that is, I'm the president of the Association of Police Monitors Office and other types of oversight around the country, including the Los Angeles Police Department's Office of Inspector General, where I worked um, for three years um, and dealt with your um, predecessor, Jaretta Tyler Eisen. So, um, and I do have to say that when, in working in LA, which was, uh, everybody was rowing in the same direction and to try and get out of their consent decree and to complete their reforms, um, that was probably a much smoother relationship than any other police monitor's office or other type of oversight office around the country. I think if you just go take a look at the LA County Sheriff's oversight and their OIG, you'll see letters online um, in which um, the and information and reports about the LA County OIG in which they've alleged that the union had, the deputies union or association has um, targeted some of their employees has upheld the sheriff not cooperating with oversight. Um, in Austin, where I was also, there were um, members of the union were alleged to have followed the first police monitor. And then, and so that be in addition to suing oversight when oversight starts in, in an effort to keep them from doing their jobs, even though at most times oversight has been voted for in many states and in many cities. Um, unions and associations then come forward and try to fight them in court, keep them from doing their work, keep them from accessing information, keep them from being able to investigate. So I have seen some obstruction from unions over the years. But one of the ways that unions have the most power is in, through collective bargaining. Now, collective bargaining is required, but it's not required that something or an agreement be reached, as long as there's good faith um, bargaining. But over the years, um, political um, officials have given a lot of concessions in the bargaining sessions in which they allow unions to even at times control what oversight is able to do. So some of it's systemic, uh, but there has certainly been a lot of other obstructive um, actions by unions against members of our organization nationwide. Um, and then when it comes to actually representing officers, which we think is absolutely necessary. Officers uh, in cities have property rights in their jobs, not necessarily deputies, but officers. And so we respect that and we do believe that they have the right to representation. Um, and so to make sure that the city is doing what it's supposed to do when they want to discipline officers or terminate their employment, um, unions play a vital role in making sure they're represented. Um, I have to say that there are times when you see union representation and there's never been an officer who's ever had conducted any misconduct of any kind ever, okay? And so that can be very troubling. Um, and so 
if there's one thing to uphold rights and zealously represent someone, it's another thing to misrepresent what's going on, um, to character assassinate people who filed complaints, so on and so forth. So there have been issues over the years. And um, I, I liked what Jaretta said, which is that the LAPPL is trying to um, be on the, the forefront of reform and change during this time for change. So I'm very respectful of that. Um, but yeah, there have been problems. Thanks. Um, so Thanks. I want to bring in Paula Ramirez. She's a member of the Los Angeles community and uh, was part of our town hall last week. And uh, you've, you've had a chance to listen to a lot of different opinions and points of view and input from all over the country. So as you look at getting back to the glass half full, half empty perception, are you uh, talk about what can be done to help the people who think the glass is half empty, bring them to half full from your perspective? Can you repeat that last? I'm so sorry. It, no, you no, cut no. out on my end. Yeah, um, no, no, I was talk just saying, about talk about how do we get from half empty to half full? Well, I think this is a great start. I think um, conversations like this, um, bringing people together with different perspectives and ideas and experiences is, is how we start to fill the glass for everybody. A little, a little bit of, you know, a drop here and a drop there from everyone um, will fill the glass. Um, I think the only way we, we move forward and, and uh, ensure that that glass is full is with everyone's participation. And um, this, is a, this is a perfect opportunity to do that. I, I, you know, John, you and I have talked and I feel like um, this is something that needs to be done at the grassroots level. It needs to be done uh, with, in partnership with law enforcement, with our um, community members, with our faith leaders. Um, I believe that all of those people need to come together and work um, towards a greater a greater future uh, for not only the city and this county and the state and this nation, just for all of us in general, so that everyone feels respected and listened to, and um, everyone's experiences are are appreciated. And um, this this is a wonderful platform for that. You know, I'm, I'm a strong believer that we're not going to get anywhere waiting for our elected or our so-called leadership to. Um, foster these conversations. I think that we just we just have to take the bull by the horns and, and do it ourselves. And I'm, I'm very excited about this project and extremely happy with the, the um, individuals that are participating. And um, we're going to do this. You know, we're, we're just we're going to do this. We're going to shed light on what needs to be illuminated. And we are going to, you know, make um, communities safer. And I think also in that bring back a level of understanding and respect for law enforcement and the difficulties that they face daily. Um, and I think in the end, we'll all just be much better for all the experiences that we've been through um, since March. Yeah, so just to clarify, um, I know Jaretta said March 25th. It was actually May 25th the, when George Floyd was killed. Um, um, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. That's yeah, okay. May. Sorry about that. I, I was, I was Look, all these, all these months are just oh, rolling together. Sorry no about, question that. about that. <laughs> um, one of the challenges I'd like to give to everybody on the call is, you know, we do these town halls every Tuesday and we've, we've had a lot of people come through and, and, and I strongly encourage everybody to try to bring another person. And hopefully that person has a different point of view than you, because the more diverse we make this group, the better the solutions that we're going to come out of this. And, and as I think a lot of you know, we're working on a national um, police standard of, of conduct similar to the military code of uni uniform code of military justice and how we can have. It's been mentioned in the chat several times about accountability. I think Enrique and Jose both both mentioned it. And there's accountability both ways, accountability for the law enforcement and accountability for our community. And we had a town hall on that earlier that Mike Haynes was uh, very much a part of. So I would like to challenge everybody to, to do bring those. We, we need more people, especially in LA. We're, we're gonna hopefully um, 
I'm thinking after the first of the year, just because with the holidays and, and everything with going on with the increase in COVID, it's going to be hard to get people together. But I'd like to do another in-person town hall and, and host it at a church like we did in Alabama and, and have, you know, we're branching out. You know, Joe, now we've got connected to you and have more youth. And Jonathan, get some college students involved. You know, we've had great uh, uh, input from our high school kids, from the... Uh, uh, junior ROTC program, Mary Yasmin and everybody else. We have a lot of veterans. Um, so my challenge to you guys is to bring more people. And, uh, you know, we're obviously going to not, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we've, we, ever since March 17th, we, I think we missed one Tuesday the whole time. And otherwise we've, we've been rocking and rolling. So, you know, bring more people to the table and, and hopefully everybody's glass will be not just half full, but the cup runneth over. Um, so I want to come back to Enrique. We started with Enrique. I want to come back to him. So Enrique, name one thing you think would make the biggest difference to make your glass half full. Are you there, Enrique? All right, we'll skip Enrique. Hopefully he'll he'll come back. Um, so I'm going to go back to you, uh, Joe. And how do you see you, you work a lot with the the youth? That's sort of your job, public affairs. Yeah, I saw you posted the uh, accountability report. So talk to us about what kind of things. You know, we did this great town hall at the YAL. Unfortunately, you know, with COVID, the a lot of things that we were hoping to do with this program, we haven't been able to do. But how can police officers build trust or change perceptions, particularly amongst our high school and college um, population? Um, it starts with us. Um, you know, we, we have to recognize the things that we're doing. Um, just like Mike says, where, you know, we, we have to, and, and also Jonathan, um, our, our menu, our mannerisms and our, um, you know, the way we act. I mean, we're not all, all. Um, I guess uh, the fact where we go to an incident and we're wearing sunglasses. It's a hot summer day, and you know what? Um, I tell younger officers all the time, where, you know, just simply take off your sunglasses for just five seconds and make that eyeball contact with that person that's trying to get through this perimeter. Um, you know, because we've completely shut down this whole block area and they can't get through because we're looking for a bad guy. But instead of just being crossed arms and, you know, talking down to the person, five seconds, take off your sunglasses and tell them what's going on and why they can't proceed. Those little things go a long way. Um, you know, we've also moved on to, uh, I'm not sure if people have heard of Days of Dialogue. We've actually included that in the academy with our recruits where uh, they have this type of round table with community members. Um, basically uh, um, one moderator, uh, one or two police officers, and maybe eight to seven uh, community members where these are recruits and they're hearing from the community and what their concerns are. And, you know, they're going back and forth and learning about the recruits and why they signed up to become a police officer. So, I think, you know, um, you know, I'm very proud of LAPD on being in the for forefront and, um, you know, believing in police reform because we're, our, our policies are really, really, really narrow. And um, if you look at our critical incident videos, uh, you know, we try our best to uh, um, use time, use our less lethal options and, you um, you know, try to uh, get the person into custody without um, any extra uh, incidents that, you know, that leads to a, a deadly force situation. So, um, so. It, it's, again, it's really difficult to uh, battle the social media uh, monster, but, you know, um, I'm glad uh, you're having these, John, and, um, you know, looking forward to uh, uh, well, other ones in the future. Well, I hope you become a regular. Um... 
One of the things I'd like to press back on you on is, you know, people talk about police reform, and I'm, I'm hoping this will light a fire under some people. I, as an organization, we always, you know, we service military vets, first responders, and their families, and we're always, I, I mean, Renato is on my team, and we always talk about how we always got to continue to get better. It's not so much about reform, is about evolution. How do you continue to do things better as as the years go on? Because what you did in 1969 or what you did in 1992 or or whatever, you you, know, you don't do those things anymore. You know, they don't carry nightsticks anymore or all those kind of things. So instead of talking about reform, just in terms of messaging and being more positive messaging, you should talk more about evolution and how the police are evolving into into the 2020 policing and what that looks like and and try to not be on the defensive as dave roberts was talking about you know go on the offensive and talk about more you know not police reform because if you're doing a good job you don't need to reform so you're not you know you can always do a better job right i mean mike haynes is shaking his head right so the first thing you do after you play football on sunday the next day you get you get together and everybody sits down and watches film and your coach hands you a sheet and on your sheet it has all the plays that you were in the game and you get a plus you get a minus and you get a score and and you know if you if you if you did well you know you you should be around 80 percent because you know in the nfl there's always good guys on the other side too and they're going to try to kick your butt but you're always trying to get better right that's why you practice you're trying to get better it's not you're trying to you know necessarily do anything but you're always you always have to be trying to get better and that's where I'd like to see the mindset of, of athletes. And Mike and you and I talked about this, I think, a week ago or so. You always got to be focused on getting better. How can you be a better police officer, Joe? How can you train the guys that you're with to be better and push them to be better and hold people accountable when they screw up? Like when that officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck, the other officers should have said, hey, wait a second, let's make sure he can breathe, you know, you know, step in and, and intervene when they see things that are maybe not the best way to go about it. And, and so that's where I'm as, as our military veterans and our mindset of always trying to get better, like in, in the military, every year you get, you know, you get evaluated, you have to do a, a fitness test, you have to do all these things. And if you and if you don't, if you're not up to snuff, you get, you know, you have to get you know, training, extra training, or if you're in the NFL, you might get cut. Um, so how do we, you know, develop that sort of mindset within law enforcement? Because I think if that mindset was there and that was permeated, it, the perception of guys like Enrique um, might be different. I don't know how, I'm going to throw it up to the room. So, because uh, we only have a few minutes left. Anybody that wants to comment on that, but I think we should talk about how the police are getting uh, evolving, not reforming. Just um, one one tidbit: our 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 best training tool is our uh, body cam videos, um, because we could show other officers how um, someone did something um, great on tactics wise, and you know the opposite on what not to do during the situation. So. Um, body cams on all our uh, 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 our divisional police officers has, has been uh, really instrumental on uh, uh, making well, us you know, better police hey, officers. One, 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 one quick thing, like the, when we played football, there was an expression that our that our coaches always used to tell us, the eye in the sky don't lie. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you brought up, uh, you, you know, we always talk about sports. Sports is a great teacher a great place to to learn and um and you were mentioning about you know guys looking at film and things like that now when we're looking at film my goal was to be the greatest player to have ever played in the national football league now my teammates their goal one of them it may have been a goal to i want to have a career in the nfl or I want to do, you know, I want to make a certain amount of money in the NFL, something like that. But all the goals are different. And because my goal was so high, I want to be one of the greatest. If you had, if you, if you got graded on 75 plays and you can either get a plus on that play or a minus on that play, 
if there was a guy that out of 75 plays and he had eight minuses, he didn't even ask a coach, what did I do wrong? He didn't even care. You know, me, if I had one minus, I'm going, coach, what are you talking about? Why did I get a minus on that play? Because my goals were so high. So I think that it, 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 your mindset really plays a role. So if, you're, if your job is, I want to be a cop because I can make a lot of money. Or I want to be a cop because I can make a positive difference in my community. You know, uh, I want to be a cop because I enjoy helping people. You know, or I want to be a cop because I'm really good at solving crime, whatever it is, you know, but those things matter. And that's the thing that I don't think people really understand when they're interviewing and trying to do, maybe they are today, uh, when they're interviewing players, football players. I, you know, we have we have kids coming to Harvard for uh, entrepreneurial program, and we'll sit down there and they say, "So, what is your goal?" He goes, "I just want to play four years in the league and get vested." Really, that's it? For me, it's like every year my goal was to go to a Super Bowl. Every year I was crying at the end of the year, you know, because I was so upset. So I think the mindset matters, and uh, I I would think that would be true being a police officer as well. Um, you know, being in the military as well, that the goals matter. Yes, I, there are some guys, they just want to be on a good team, period, you know, the end. And they don't have a, um, a, a, a level of, you know, how they grade that. But the guy at the top, he should have an idea of what he wants. His vision will help shape everybody in his unit, you know, and all those guys will have high goals uh, and all of them will know why they have high goals and they will all, you know, um, you know, be accountable for each other. And, and that's what I loved about football. I would, I want to be the best. I want to be on the best team. Well, I can't just keep that information that I have to myself. I have to tell Lester. He has to tell me. We want to play in a Super Bowl. I have to see what the safety doing. Hey, you got, you helping me on this play or not? No, I'm helping Lester. Okay. All right. You know, but we communicate, we talk and we work it out because we all had the same goals. And I think that um, getting everybody on the same page is not always easy because everybody doesn't come from the same place, doesn't have the same life experiences, but that's the goal. That should be the goal. And um, that, that's what I think has helped me, um, you know, deal with a lot of problems I've had and on the field and on. Pastor Jackson, you were gonna say something? I, I, I was, I think you, Sound like you've been in my, <laughs> one of my meetings, John. I haven't, but anyway, <laughs> go ahead. Great minds think alike. And, and what, what, yeah, what, what I'm leading to is that whenever I'm meeting with my uh, the deacons, uh, the trustees, or even the associate ministers and Clyde, uh, Reverend Jones' his own, I always conclude that what I personally can do, be doing better, because sometimes I get tunnel vision, you know, serving as a pastor, and then I, I turn it around and say, okay, now what can we do better? So it's not, it's not just me, but it's collectively all of us working together to make the church better and to be really doing what, what God has called us to do. So when, And then when you said something else is for us to practicing, and, and I love it, I think if we take that approach and take it to the police department, and that was uh, that we always should be striving to be better and practicing, and, and it just hit me as like uh, uh, lawyers, even though they have a, a Esquire degree, they are said to be practicing law. People in the medical field have spent eight plus years and they are practicing medicine. In other words, they're always trying to make it better and never be perfected, but they're always working to get better. And I think if, if when you get ready to take it to the law enforcement, saying I'm practicing to be an officer, I, I, I hadn't reached the, the expectation, I hadn't reached perfection, but I'm always willing to get better at my perfection. And so if we take that to, to them and take it to the, the uh, law enforcement and to everyone really that we're always working to get better. And even as a Christian, uh, I'm still working to reach that goal. And it's a high goal, so I never reach it while here on earth, but I'm still practicing to become more Christ-like each and every day of my life. 
And so that same approach uh, with the police department, I believe, will help instead of just saying we're going to get rid of it and start all over. What can we improve on? What can we do better? And that starts at the top and then getting input from the, the, the law enforcement as well as the citizens. Uh, but I think it has to start there. No, that's good. I mean, I, I think you. that the the approach and the mindset, that's what we have to change. And that will help change perception. Um, so uh, I had I had a chance to uh, sit down with the chairman of the board of MGM Resorts a couple, a couple years ago. We were doing a, a retreat in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, we were sitting there talking. And, and he was noticing that there was a broken chair. And it was just the most minor little broken chair defect. You you know, wouldn't I, no, most normal people wouldn't even have noticed it, but he noticed it. And he right away called the maintenance guys and said, get that chair out of there. And uh, we, we started talking about it. And he said, there's two speeds in life, forward and backward. Anybody who's in neutral is getting passed by. And uh, it was just an interesting uh come from the chairman of MGM. I mean, they're in the customer service business like no other, right? So, and when you think about it, um, the law enforcement's in the customer service business too. They're trying to serve, protect and serve their community. And so that's where I think, you know, hopefully uh, I'd like to get the take from, from you, Joe, and also from Paul on, on what we're talking about now before we close. Paul, are, are you still there? Yeah, I am. Um, God, um, what uh, Mike said was awesome about, you know, wanting to be, you know, the best um, in every day, just trying to get better um, in, you know, my 16 years of law enforcement and having the, the professional athlete background. Um, it's something I've been railing about for years. Um, I'm a firearms instructor, active shooter instructor, and it just drives me crazy. And I'll use something like firearms as an example. You know, how many guys just show up to do their, their training or, or their qualifications, and it's, all right, I shot my 80%, gun goes back in the holster. I've done enough to keep my job for another, you know, six months. Okay, I'm good. Let's Let's go back to doing what we were doing. And it's, you know, it's a total opposite of what, you know, I tried to exercise and you know, what Mike was talking about that, okay. you know, elite athlete mindset. Um, and I'm not doing a very good, I'm obviously not doing a very good job of, um, you know, passing it along. Cause I just feel like every time I, you know, I might say something like, you know, after an active shooter training, you know, episode, some guys will be like, oh yeah, like that was good, but you know, we're not going to get to, you know, practice it again for a while and I'll forget it. And, and that's kind of their way of being like, yeah, admin isn't letting us train enough. And then I look at them and I go, well, when was the last time you asked for more training? So, and I get a blank stare back, you know, and then I know, I know there's people, you know, kind of talking bad about me you know I me mean? oh yeah paul's you know paul's too gung-ho paul's too this paul's too that and um you know so i um i'm obviously not doing a very good job of trying to get people in that mindset of hey like let's be great at what we do you never know you know when the moment is going to come that you get a chance to be a hero you know that's going to be the defining moment of your career it's like you know, like Mike was saying, like, hey, this could be the year we get to the Super Bowl. When we get there, do we want to fail? We want to succeed. You so, prepare so, now so real quick, for sorry that for moment and um, that mindset. When you have a police department, how many uh, LAPD right. police officers are there, Joe? Uh, roughly around. Okay, so 10,000. Just okay, over so 10,000. How do we... <laughs> Because there's no way you're going to get 10,000 officers on the same page. Not going to happen. It's hard enough getting 53 NFL football players on the same page, let alone. Okay, so how can we? 100%. Yeah. You know, if we're going to evolve and we're going to change perception and go on the offense, to, to Dave Roberts' quote, does that start at the police academy? Where does that start? Um, I believe it's at the leadership level and, um, what, what the ground level officers see, um, you know, it's, it's always leading by example, right? When, like whenever there's a team, um, there's always one or two team leaders that the team looks up to and, and feed off and learn from. And, um, you know, same thing with a, uh, a watch, you know, whether if it's morning watch or, 
uh, uh, day watch. I mean, there's there's those uh, veteran officers that, you know what, um, they need to pass on the the great mindset of uh, of uh, leadership and you know not just getting by but you know beyond that. Um, again, uh, you know, becoming a better officer starts with us. You know, um, and uh, always striving to uh, become better officers every day. I mean, especially with firearms. You know, whenever I think of uh, pulling this gun out of uh, during a situation where uh, it meets that requirement, I have to worry about the background. I have to worry about each round that. I put out goes to the one that I want to get to because if I miss, it's going to go through someone's house down the way. And, and those thoughts go through every officer's mind. I mean, so you have to practice. And, um, you know, last thing I want is to pull this gun out for any uh, uh, reason, but if it comes down to it, um, those little things, you, we all have to be accountable for each round. So, um, you know, we have to practice our craft, and that craft is not just uh, being tactical, but being mindful on how we act and what we say and, uh, you know, how we look and basically saying hello to people. I mean, I love hanging out in line at a Chipotle or a Starbucks and chit-chatting away with the person behind me or, you know, uh, in front of me. Uh, it's kind of hard these days with COVID, but, you know, I mean, I try my best to say hello and, you um, other officers see that and and hopefully it's that kind of uh setting that uh example you know set an example so is, i strive to, yeah, set an example i try important. to reach that so as we follow up and finish up here um enrique's back and so uh, i don't know if you've been listening to most of the town hall i know you've been running around but what is the one thing that you take away from today that 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 helps you uh go from glass half empty to glass half full I think what to take it away is that both both sides wants to come to resolution and want actually work together. That's what I took away from this uh, town. But it's gonna take it's gonna take time uh, before the the both uh, meet at the at that point. So uh, I'm gonna throw it to Mayor Yasmin because we we love the mayor. It's always good to have the mayor. Um, what what what's your what's your big takeaway from today? My big takeaway from today is that um, is that things aren't one sided. Um, other people on the other side are also working towards getting better, and that um, we just have to talk so that we can prove and that people do want to improve and that there is hope out there to become better and to avoid situations that nice. have already uh, er is body is that how you say your first name as bd okay oh, it's as so, so you had some comments uh, yeah. uh about in the beginning so what's your big takeaway from today is your glass getting it more half full or are you still half empty Uh, maybe I gave the wrong impression about, you know, my opinion towards it. Um, I did have contact with a police officer, police officer many times, not for my situations, but situations I was involved in from being in a store and stuff. Uh, my, I could say my glass is half full right now because I understand when you guys were saying body language, maybe I wasn't expressing myself right when I was talking towards an officer or I could be... Um, maybe not being too direct with them or not having the same communication with them. But nice. that's something I got from uh, Fari, uh, what's your big takeaway from today? Well, I think that it's, uh, that I enjoyed hearing about everyone and their perspectives and how, and the changes that many of you guys and I, that I agree with, Okay. Um, Colonel Hensley, so how do we get more of the cadets to participate in this? And also, I'll throw that to Jonathan and on the college level. 
because that's the that's the demographic that's out there in the streets right now it's it's the sort of 15 to 30 kind of group so how do we how do we reach more of those you especially now with with covid these these virtual town halls we 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 need to get more kids involved so we can so we can make sure that perception isn't reality and that reality is reality yeah i'd like to you know probably garner up support from first sergeant mexica and maybe have first sergeant mexica send out an email to all the instructors and let him know let them know from his perspective how these town halls are going uh, they my instructors don't always listen to the boss and you know colonel huntley my deputy is on right now and he's shaking his head and he agrees um you know they don't always listen to the boss and they don't always listen to the deputy but sometimes they'll listen to another instructor so i think at first Sergeant mexica maybe you know ginned up a little bit more interest in saying hey i'm telling you right now guys this stuff works and my kids are getting a lot out of it that'll help a lot and uh and i agree we you know we need to get more jonathan's we need to get more of the college and university level kids involved as well and i'm calling you a kid jonathan because i've got i've got a daughter that just turned 35 okay so <laughs> you know I'm 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 like Mike Haynes, you know. I'm I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm in the You're sixty in, my, in the sixty club, you know. Yeah, I'm seasoned. I'm seasoned, you know. And I'm not. I don't have a lot of this up here. That's why I wear hats all the time. <laughs> but I, I like what Mike said about setting those really high goals. And when you have, and you're when you're an organization, when you have different goals and different standards, you're going to have a problem. If your goal is to be the very best in the NFL. And then you have somebody else on your team that you're really counting on, and his goal is to make you know 1.5 million a year, and that's it. Are you really gonna? Is that person gonna really have your back? Is that person really striving to win a Super Bowl, or is this person just trying to get into the Pro Bowl and take care of himself and take care of his own stats? You know, so it's it's got to be a team effort. People always have to have the you know I think the same goals and same interests. And that's what we need to pass on to our young people um, as we get them more involved. You're shaking your head, Jonathan. Oh, uh, I, I just want to make sure the colonel's done uh, speaking. Um, so pretty much the only thing I, we really need uh, to get more people involved is information. Uh, this is my first meeting. And now that I've been in this first meeting and I saw some volunteer events, I'm going to make sure to get some cadets out there. Uh, I love doing volunteer events, and, and they do as well. We, I just didn't have the information, really. So uh, now that I know about the meetings and uh, any volunteer events that come up, I'm going to push it out to the cadets and, and make sure we get some people there. Uh, and if they don't want to go, they're going to be voluntold uh, because uh, that's what leaders do. I got, I, got, I got to get them out there. Uh, doing some good things to the community and then uh it'll give them a little taste of what the yeah, army's so we like do as well have a, uh, we're gonna do this <laughs> a, a, a event i posted it in the chat uh we're doing a thanksgiving holiday uh drive-by giveaway with the dodgers on thursday you have to be at dodger stadium by 11 30. uh the giveaway i think starts at uh i think 12 30 or one o'clock and uh you know they're going to give away 1500 thanksgiving meals people will drive through um for all the volunteers will get ppe and a dodger hat so uh good incentive to get out there um it's a, it's a great way for renata and i will be out there um recruiting community people to participate in these town halls and uh um, obviously it's good for the community especially mm -hmm. those in need at thanksgiving so hopefully encourage everybody to to get involved and then um you know we're going to continue these town halls uh, we, we have a great group of people and, you know, we're making good progress. I mean, uh, you know, we've done some things Jaretta didn't talk about, but, you know, we had our bias, uh, bias, prejudice, racism, town hall, and how uh, officers are trained at the LAPD and what the police union can do to better train officers on bias. That, that's going forward. Uh, Susan Hudson. Um, is working with the city of Arlington, Texas, as a result of our town hall on, on police accountability and how civilian oversights, so they're setting up a civilian oversight police commission in the city of Arlington, Texas. And we've had some other, um, you know, the work that we did in Alabama with Pastor Jackson, uh, with the Daphne High School kids, 
was a major uh, success. And so, you know, we are making a difference. And so um, we got to continue to push because, uh, you know, as the old saying goes, Rome wasn't built overnight. So, uh, you know, we got a lot of work to do, but I think if we, if we can go with it, the right mindset and, and, and communicate that mindset, uh, we can change perspective. Anybody? Mm -hmm. And I Excellent. sent out the email. Yes, man. I got I got your email, and uh, I'm gonna push that okay. out to some of our cadets today, and uh, make sure we get some yeah. some awesome. numbers on there. Great. Yeah. See, the difference between Jonathan and I is that I can't tell my cadets to be part of this <laughs> because this is after school. But Jonathan, if he's got contract cadets, he can because those contract <laughs> cadets, if they're MS three or four cadets, they they work. 24-7 for ROTC. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then the, they, the thing then is, they go to college. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's 18 and over. So we, uh, I, I, would, I didn't push it out to the high school kids because uh, the Dodgers, because of COVID and, um, you know, liability stuff, they didn't want to have kids. I was going to bring my son to do it. But any any officers, Joe, that are off duty or, or maybe you guys are already get, know about it and, and are going to be around, um, but anybody wants to you know, participate, it's basically you stand in a spot and people drive by and you hand it through the window. So you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, physical distancing will be in place and uh, it'll be a great event. Yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll be a part of it somehow. Um, yeah, well, I uh, just wanted to throw it out there. I'm having a, a chief forum with uh, um, three universities tomorrow, which, uh, I kind of wanted to have it small, so we're going to have about um, 20 to 30 students uh, representing their class, and hopefully they take back what they experience. So, you know, these are going to be ongoing. So these are the little things that we're doing uh, with LAPD. So, um, you know, they could ask, you know, the easy questions like, do cops like donuts? Yes, it <laughs> does taste better in uniform. Or why do you keep on shooting people? So, uh, you know what? Uh, we just need, again, it's been reiterated, uh, it's all about communication and we're trying to, um, you know, create no, that great. avenue. And if you want us can. to be involved in any of those or invite those guys to participate in ours, ours are, are open. It's the same link every Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, military guys like to be creatures of habit, so it makes it easy. Um, but, uh, you know, we change the topic each week and try to try to focus on one particular area or another. And, you know, when we had empathy and, and perception was talked about, that, that became the next topic. And so anyway, we're, we're going to continue to push and uh, hopefully we're going to get more people, uh, you know, with the holiday next Tuesday, we'll see how many people show up, but uh, we're going to keep pressing. I want to thank everybody for a lot of great stuff here. And hopefully I'll, for those of you in the LA area, um, we'll see you guys out at Dodger Stadium on Thursday.